Hey guys, I want to give you this disclaimer that this video has not been edited. My recording of reading this um, motion to you all, I didn't go back and edit it and, you know, edit out my miscues, misstatements, you know, mispronunciations of words because I have a really busy weekend, but I wanted to bring this to you all um, as soon as possible because I didn't know if I would be able to get to it until Monday if I delayed doing it. Hey everybody, this is Tracy here with another edition of A View from Tracy's Point. And we are here with the defense's response to the government's motion <laughs> where they want to include these new witnesses, these Jane Doe's, these John Doe's, and all other kind of stuff. Um, I will post the video to that motion above so you can check it out and see what that's all about if you are not familiar with the motion and so this was written by nicole and thomas farinella and it always kind of perplexes me how sometimes the motions will have all the attorneys listed and then sometimes it'll only have one attorney listed in this instance it has just nicole and thomas listed as the defense for R. Kelly. And so I just think as a, you know, just to show that they are a cohesive unit when they're filing these motions, they should list all the attorneys, how with the government, you know, when they do motions, they'll list the, the actual attorney, um, United States attorney, even though that person has nothing to do with the motion that they file. And then they will list the assistant United States attorneys who's actually working on the case. And so just a pet peeve of mine, it has no legality to it whatsoever. Just my thoughts and opinions on, you know, how they need to just, you know, show that they're all in this together. They're working on this together. So let's go ahead and get started. It says preliminary statement. Mr. Kelly respectfully submits this memorandum in opposition to the government's motion in limine to admit at trial evidence of certain acts by Mr. Kelly. This evidence of certain acts offered in the government's motion are unequivocally inadmissible under the federal rules of evidence because the government's request is untimely, not relevant, and if permitted will cause severe prejudice to Mr. Kelly of which such prejudice outweighs the probative value. Therefore, if the court does not deny the government's motion, Mr. Kelly's constitutional rights will be violated as well as his right to a fair trial. And then they start with section one and it says lack of timeliness by the government in producing the other act witnesses a timeliness of the other acts evidence understanding that the government in many federal criminal cases request permission of the court for the use of 404 b evidence of an excused i'm sorry of an accused extrinsic acts of which is viewed as an important asset to the government's case against an accused the fact comes with the understanding that certain time limits will be adhered to so as to not prejudice the defense the 2020 amendments to rule 404 b contains additional notice requirements placed on the government in a criminal case rule 404 b federal rules of evidence requires the prosecution to provide reasonable notice of any other criminal evidence the prosecutor intends to offer at trial. The notice is to be in advance of trial. See Rule 404B3. Additionally, per Rule 404B, the government must not only identify the evidence that it intends to offer pursuant to the rule, but also articulate a non-propensity purpose for which the evidence is offered and the basis for concluding that the evidence is relevant in light of this purpose 
So effective December 1st, 2020, Rule 404B notice requirement was moved to the new Rule 404B3 and mandatory and made mandatory the author's comments 404B4 and 404B11. The amendment to Rule 404B makes clear that notice is required. The pretrial notice must be in writing, which the requirement is satisfied by notice in electronic form, see Rule 101B6. Requiring the notice to be in writing provides certainty and reduces arguments about whether notice was actually provided. The government did provide notice in writing per Rule 404B. The part of the 404B rule that was not followed by the government is the fact that notice must be provided before trial in such time as to allow the defendant a fair opportunity to meet the evidence unless the court excuses that requirement upon a showing of good cause. See Rule 609B, 807, and 90211. Advanced notice of Rule 404B evidence is important so that the parties and the court have adequate opportunity to assess the evidence, the purpose for which it is offered, and whether the requirements of Rule 403 have been satisfied, even in cases in which a final determination is to the admissibility of the evidence must await trial. The good cause exception applies not only to the timing of the notice as a whole but also to the timing of the obligation see rule 404b and so want to stop here and i explained to you guys in the last video that 404b and then i think there's a 404c but basically these are the rules set forth by the by the um, government which permits or disallows the use of these bad acts witnesses or people that come up and say that they've had similar experiences as the actual witnesses in the case and then they are allowed to come in and i refer back to the bill cosby case how the first time bill cosby was on trial they had one of these bad act witnesses and the they ended up in a hung jury and so then they re-prosecuted him and this time they allowed in five bad act witnesses and then it was those five bad act witnesses telling their stories that strengthened the government's case and led to his conviction and we know that that conviction was overturned because um the main reason it was overturned was because the prior district attorney had promised that he would never be prosecuted if he participated in this, in this, um, oh my God, I can't even think of the word, deposition. I'm sorry guys, I just finished mowing my lawn and I'm a little out of breath, <laughs> okay? But I have some stuff to do later on today and the rest of this weekend, and that's why I stopped to do this video for you guys. But anyway, the deposition Bill Cosby contributed to, participated in, under the understanding that he would never be charged for what the deposition was about, and then we know that he was charged. They didn't really have a strong case, so to strengthen the case, they brought in these people to tell these stories that had never been criminally charged, and that's how they got the conviction. And so it was sort of twofold. Number one, he was promised he would never be prosecuted. And number two, you had to bring all these people in in order to get that conviction, and thereby you violated his rights to a fair trial. And so 404 just basically breaks down when they can bring in these bad act witnesses and when they cannot bring them in and how the defense, you know, can oppose what they're trying to do. And that's what's happening here in this document. So the government must articulate a non-propensity purpose for requesting Jane Doe's and John Doe's testimony in order to be properly admitted and the reasoning supporting that purpose. Oftentimes, the gathering of such information and the formation of such theories takes a lengthy period of time. The defense should be granted an equal amount of time as the government when it comes to formulating arguments against their request. Under the current schedule before the court, the defense is prejudiced by the timing of 
notice given by the government. And I agree because I'm sure it took them a long time to put together them 55 and 61 page documents that I read to you all. They had months, probably a year to put that stuff together. And then they only want to give the defense a week to respond to it, which we already discussed in the comments on those videos is very prejudicial and unfair. So the government filed their notice with the court to admit certain uncharged acts on July 30th, 2021, July, I'm sorry, on July 23rd, 2021. July 23rd, 2021 is only 16 days prior to jury selection, which is considered the start of jury trial. Mr. Kelly was afforded a mere seven days to respond to the other acts motion of which the government has not revealed any of the Jane Doe's or John Doe's identities. Not only is the defense responsible for answering the government's other acts motion filed on July 20th, 21, but the government also filed an additional lengthy motion in limine to admit certain evidence and preclude certain evidence also with short notice. On the exact same day, the government supplied additional 3,500 material to the defense, all of which require a thorough analysis prior to trial. It is impossible for the defense to properly defend Mr. Kelly when the filing of the government's notice has not been provided in such time as to allow the defendant a fair opportunity to meet the guidance. Given the nearness of trial, the defense is not given ample amount of time to ensure an adequate opportunity to assess the evidence, the purpose for which the evidence is offered, and whether the requirements of Rule 403 have been satisfied or not. Therefore, the defense believes it is appropriate for the court to dismiss the government's motion in its entirety. And I agree with you, Nicole and Thomas. <laughs> like, they need to stop playing games here. And really, you know, just putting stuff out in the media to get people to talking, probably hoping that the potential jurors are going to read this information and file, you know, and just create these opinions in their minds. Because remember, the notices either went out last week or are about to go out for the jury questionnaires. You know, they're going out in the mail for people to complete. And so if you're completing the jury questionnaire and the news is out there saying, you know, oh, R. Kelly, there's more people coming out, more victims, more witnesses. Now they got John Doe's. He's been messing with young men. So that's going through the juror's mind. So you're putting that in their mind as they're filling out this juror questionnaire. And to me, that is just so prejudicial that I just think that if this man is found guilty, they are going to have so many grounds on an appeal that it is just going to be ridiculous. So moving right ahead. So B, jury questionnaire. The final jury questionnaire was due in June of 2021. The jury questionnaires were approved by both the government and the defense. And guys, I still need to bring um, that video to you all where I talk about the jury questionnaire and some of the stuff that was entered and some of the stuff that was taken out. On July 26, 2021, the distribution of the jury questionnaires took place. Okay, so they're saying that that happened last week. So post the jury questionnaire having been sent out, the government filed their other acts motion. The other acts motion references two John Doe's that the government requests to call as 404B witnesses. The two John Doe's alleged to have had same-sex relationship with Mr. Kelly. The questionnaires sent to the potential jurors on Mr. Kelly's case are void of a single question about their opinions or feelings on same-sex relationships. The topic of sexual orientation has become a controversial as politics, has become as controversial as politics. The topic would have been ripe for questioning in the jury questionnaire. Thus, failure to include such questions violates Mr. Kelly's constitutional right to a fair trial trial. 
Because the government has had access to all the evidence in Mr. Kelly's case for over two years, there is no question that they were aware of the John Doe's allegations long before the jury questionnaires were finalized. Despite possessing this information, there was never any mention by the government that this controversial topic would potentially be part of Mr. Kelly's trial. The defense was blindsided. Therefore, given the serious nature of the government's proposed allegations by the John Doe's and a lack of transparency in an effort to address the jury pool on this issue alone should bar the government's request to introduce any evidence concerning the John Doe's. And guys, when I, I am reading this for the first time as I'm reading it to you, okay, so when I made that comment about tainting the jury, I had not read any of this that she was writing here. So it goes on to say a written jury questionnaire should propound questions that are balanced to aid in the selection of a fair and impartial jury, United States versus Wilson, which was a case in the Eastern District of New York from 2006. Questions may be proper and indeed necessary if they deal with subject matter that would demonstrate impermissible bias on the part of a juror. And then United States versus Fell, which was from 2005, it says there is no question that the only purpose for which government seeks to introduce evidence from the John Doe's is purely salacious and sensational reasons. It is indisputable that the allegations of the alleged same-sex relationships is a subject matter that would demonstrate impermissible bias on the part of a juror. The failure to include any questions about the specific and unique subject matter of the potential jurors to respond to make the selection of a fair and impartial jury impossible. Therefore, Mr. Kelly respectfully requests that the court deny the government's motion in its entirety. The failure to do so would result in his constitutional right to a fair trial and an impartial jury would be violated. And then in section two, their argument, the federal rules of evidence governs the admissibility of evidence of prior or subsequent bad acts, evidence of crimes, wrongs, or acts other than those charged in the indictment. See Federal Evidence 404B. The Federal Rules of Evidence further prohibit admission of evidence of other crimes, wrongs, or acts to prove the character of a person in order to show action in conformity therewith. Additionally, Rule 404B prohibits the admission of such evidence if it proves the character of a person to show his propensity to commit the charged act, but permits its admission for other purposes. Other act evidence serves a proper purpose so long as it is not offered to show the defendant's propensity to commit the offense. United States Curley versus Curley which was, let's see, it doesn't give the year or the court. Okay, looks like this case was from 2011 and it was a United States appellate case that they heard. Okay, and so it says the Federal District Court of New York follows the inclusionary approach with it, which admits all other acts evidence that does not serve the sole purpose of following the defendant's bad character and that is neither overly prejudicial under Rule 403 nor irrelevant under Rule 402, United States versus Pascarella which was from 1996 and it was a case heard by the second circuit. And it says, even under this approach, however, district courts should not presume that such evidence is relevant or admissible United States versus Halper, which was also from the second circuit in 1978. And so they're basically saying that um, trying to admit that evidence about them John Doe's is irrelevant to this case. And it, you know, it's not needed for them to um, put their case on and get a guilty verdict if that's what, you know, they're looking for, which they are. Okay, so to satisfy the relevance inquiry, the evidence must be sufficiently similar to the conduct at issue to permit the jury reasonably to draw from that act 
the state of mind inference advocated by the proponent of the evidence. United States versus Peterson, um, the district court must consider all the evidence presented to the jury and determine whether a reasonable jury would find the advocated reference or inference. Huddleston, let's see, United States versus Ramirez, and this was heard in the Second Circuit, 1990, and Huddleston, I'm thinking, was the, jur- was the judge who made that statement in their ruling and so the court abuses is abuses is discretion lord have mercy the courts the court abuses its discretion i don't know what she's trying to say here the court abuses its discretion if the evidence is not sufficiently similar to the charge conduct or if the chain of references or inferences necessary to connect the evidence with the ultimate fight to be proved is unduly long peterson and that was internal quotation marks omitted Um, if the evidence is relevant the district court must determine if its potential for unfair prejudice substantially outweighs its probative value And then they talk about um, evidence in 403. The evidence's probative value depends depends largely on whether or not there is a close parallel between the crime charged and the acts shown. United States versus Gordon, which was also heard by the Second Circuit in 1993. And then it says evidence is unfairly prejudicial when it tends to have some adverse effect upon the defendant beyond tending to prove the fact or issue that justified its admission into evidence. United States versus Messino, Second Circuit in 2008. If the other acts tend to prove a fact not an issue or to excite emotions against the defendant, they create a prejudicial effect. United States versus Figueroa, and that was heard by the Second Circuit in 1980. The district court abuses its discretion when it admits other acts, evidence with a high possibility of jury misuse, but with only significantly more probative value than other evidence on the same issue. Um, then they say, see McCullum 584, and they give where the comment was located in the court's opinion. Permitting the introduction of other crimes evidence, particularly in a criminal case, poses the danger that the jury will view it as reflecting on the party's character and reach a verdict because it was concluded that the party is a bad person deserving punishment. United States versus Linares, which was heard by um, D.C. Circuit Court 2004, Protection against such a danger comes from four sources. One, from adherence to the command of Rule 404B that such evidence may be admitted only for a non-character purpose. Two, from the relevancy requirement embraced in Rule 402. Three, from Rule 403. And four, from the use of limiting instructions, Huddleston versus United States. And this was a case from 1988, and it says, see United States versus Gomez, which was heard by the Seventh Circuit in 2014, discussing proper instruction. The requirement that other crime evidence may be admitted only for a non-character purpose means that the proponents of such evidence must do more than conjure up a proper purpose. They must also establish a chain of interferences, no link of which is based on the propensity inference, United States versus Smith. And that was from the third secret in 2013 and United States versus Gomez, seventh circuit, 2014. And so I think what they are trying to say here is that R. Kelly is on trial for these charges against the bribery case, you know, with Aaliyah has nothing to do with a same sex relationship the 
Jane Doe's two through six, none of them have anything to do with a same sex relationship. So therefore entering this into the evidence is basically prejudicing the jury, especially if the jury has feelings about same sex relationships. And so they're saying that this case, you know, with the John Doe's are totally irrelevant. And so then it goes on to say case law in this circuit is clear. Judge William Pauley, who has been lauded for his fairness as jurist in the United States versus Dodgerdus, Dargadus held that 404B requires the government to provide defendants with reasonable notice of any extrinsic acts evidence it intends to offer at trial. While defendants requested Rule 404B disclosure on February 5th, 2010, the government did not disclose its intent to offer evidence on the MLD transaction until it produced its exhibit list on January 17, 2011. This court has cautioned the government repeatedly about the need to cabinets proof and provide advanced disclosure of the transactions to be offered at trial. Given the magnitude of this case, defendants cannot adequately prepare to rebuke I'm sorry. Defendants cannot adequately prepare to rebut evidence related to the MLD transaction with approximately one month remaining before trial. Um, federal rules evidence 404B. Advisory Committee's note 1991 amendment, the amendment to rule 404B as a pretrial notice requirement in criminal cases and is intended to reduce surprise and promote notice requirement in criminal cases and is intended to reduce surprise and promote early resolution on the issue of admissibility. Accordingly, the government is precluded from introducing any evidence relating to the MLD transaction. U.S. versus Dodgers 2011 WL and then it gives the code where it's located. This court should mirror the ruling giving the magnitude of this case, which is indisputable and conclude that Mr. Kelly would suffer irreparable prejudice if the government's motion is granted with less than one month remaining before trial. Similar to the case at bar, the defense was not given reasonable notice of any extrinsic acts evidence until less than 30 days before trial. Given the magnitude of this case, just like in Dodger, this Mr. Kelly cannot adequately prepare to rebut the evidence of additional allegations made by 13 Jane Doe's and to John Doe's. Accordingly, the defense requests the court preclude the government from introducing any other acts, evidence, and deny the government's motion in its entirety. Section 3. Opposition to the government's request to enter evidence of the defendant's other acts. There are 13 Jane Doe's and 2 John Doe's whose identities are still confidential. The court must determine admissibility of their proposed testimony by the government. None of the names of the Jane Doe's or John Doe's have been disclosed to the defense. Without disclosure of their names, it is merely impossible to adequately respond to the government's motion, especially given the fact that Mr. Kelly and defense have had a mere seven days to respond. The standard for pretrial disclosure of witnesses is whether a specific showing of need for disclosure by the defendant outweighs a specific showing of need for concealment to by the government. See United States versus Goldman, which was a case from the Southern District of New York in 1977, and the United States versus Cannon, which was from the Second Circuit, which was an appeal in 1975. 
and I agree with them on this because like they don't even know who these people are. So how can they argue whether the people should be allowed or not allowed what the people are going to say when they get up there? The defense shouldn't be surprised by anything that comes out during the trial. And so it was greatly prejudiced, not only Mr. Kelly, but the defense as well in putting forth a proper trial against him, a proper defense against him. And so this is basically the government blindfolding the defense and Mr. Kelly and just guiding them into the courtroom and saying, okay, have at it. You know, like they have no idea who these people are. They don't know if these people are telling the truth or none of that stuff. And so this is really crazy. And I really appreciate how Nicole has written this because, you know, Greenberg ain't no telling what he would have put out. So it goes on and says the Jane Doe's in the government's other acts motion are no less important than the Jane Doe's and John Doe's in the superseding indictment. A single Jane Doe or John Doe that is allowed to testify against the defendant must be met with the same rigorous cross-examination throughout the trial as Jane Doe's number one through six. Therefore, without the knowledge of the identity of the Jane and John Doe's with whom the defense is entitled to thoroughly cross-examine, the defense is at a disadvantage when it comes to adequately preparing and effectively defending Mr. Kelly at trial. More importantly, it is impossible for the defense to make effective arguments necessary to combat the introduction of each 404B witness proposed by the government when the defense is in the dark as to the identities of the Jane and John Doe. A. Jane Doe number one, a minor. The government seeks to introduce evidence regarding Mr. Kelly's alleged abuse of Jane Doe number one to prove his motive for engaging in racketeering act one bribery. The defense believes the evidence the government seeks to admit lacks reliability, eviscerates Mr. Kelly's Sixth Amendment right to confront his accusers and should be excluded for prejudice and or confusion under rule 403. And you guys know Jane Doe number one is Aaliyah who unfortunately died in a tragic plane crash. So Mr. Kelly, Mr. Kelly has a right to confront his accusers. This right is a right which is guaranteed in the confrontation clause of the Sixth Amendment of the United States Constitution, Crawford versus Washington, which was from who heard this and when did they hear it? Um, looks like it was a case from 2004. And the opinion I'm thinking was a Justice Callahan. And it was a case in Florida, it looks like. But I can't tell for sure. But it says testimonial statements of witnesses absent from trial are admitted only where the defendant is unavailable. I'm sorry. Testimonial statements of witnesses absent from trial are admitted only where the declarant is unavailable and only where the defendant has had a prior opportunity to cross-examine. Per Rule 804 hearsay exceptions, a declarant is unavailable if he or she is unable to present or to testify at the hearing because of death or then existing physical or mental illness or infirmity. In the government's motion, representations are made that abuse of Jane Doe number one occurred at the hands of Mr. Kelly. The government asserts that while Jane Doe number one was still a minor, Kelly began a relationship with her and in August 1994, when she was 15, Kelly believed that she was pregnant. There is absolutely no physical proof nor circumstantial proof that any of these allegations put forth by the government are true. Jane Doe number one is unable to testify that any of the above allegations are true. They are merely accusations that assist in forming the government's narrative. 
first due to the unfortunate passing away of Jane Doe number one on August 21st, 2001, she is legally unavailable. Second, the defendant has never had a prior opportunity to cross-examine Jane Doe number one prior to her passing away. Therefore, the additional information the government seeks to introduce regarding Jane Doe number one is nothing more than conjure conjecture and an effort to further shape their narrative in the government's last attempt to be granted permission to get their narrative in regarding Jane Doe number one the government wrote given Jane Doe number one's age the bribery charge and racketeering act one was necessary to effectuate the marriage this sentence alone may be appropriate for jurors to hear when attempting to prove the bar the bribery charge the rest is an effort to support their narrative with no actual evidence to support such prejudicial allegations so they're basically saying if you want to say that he bribed an official to perform this marriage or to give this not to perform the marriage but to approve the marriage certificate and knowing that it was false that it had a fake age on it that's one thing but then to come in and provide a story as to why they needed this fake marriage certificate is something that only Aaliyah can testify to and since there are no documents stating that she ever said that or confirmed that or that there are no medical records to show that she was pregnant or was not pregnant, that there was an abortion or anything like that, then they are basically going on hearsay that this is what Demetrius Smith said was the reasoning and that the jury should believe them and that therefore this is hearsay, it's not founded in any evidence to back up his claim that that was the reason why they you know, bribed this official to get this marriage license. So in the government's last attempt to be granted permission to get their narrative in regarding Jane Doe number one, the government wrote, okay, I already read that. I'm sorry. Lastly, rule 403 does not support the evidence coming in. Rule 403 stands for the premise that the court may exclude relevant evidence if its probative value is substantially outweighed by a danger of one or more of the following unfair one or more of the following unfair prejudice, confusing the issues, misleading the jury, undue delay, wasting time or needlessly presenting cumulative evidence if the government somehow proves the evidence they wish to admit is relevant the allegations made regarding Jane Doe number one and Mr. Kelly still should not be allowed in because their probative value is substantially outweighed by a danger of unfair prejudice confusing the issues and misleading the jury see rule 403 and then b abuse allegations of Jane Doe 7 through Jane Doe 20. In the event the court is prepared to allow Jane Doe 7 through Jane Doe 20 to testify, the defense vehemently objects. It is the defense's position that without knowing the names of Jane Doe 7 through Jane Doe 20, the defense cannot effectively show the court why each and every Jane Doe should be stricken. If the names of the Jane Doe's are revealed to the defense, the defense will certainly be able to promulgate the proper response for objecting to their introduction under the law. However, given the time restraints in the trial scheduled and with only 10 days left until the trial actually begins, the government should be rewarded for its untimely, the government should be rewarded. I think she says shouldn't, maybe that should be shouldn't reward it, shouldn't be rewarded for its untimely and late disclosure. More importantly, the court should consider all of the reasons stated above in denying the government's motion as to Jane Doe number seven through Jane Doe 20. I think in that last sentence, that should not say the trial begins, the government should be rewarded. I think it should, that should say that the government should not be rewarded. And hopefully um, Judge Dunley will see it for what they meant to say. Um, C, sexual abuse, allegations of John Doe number one and John Doe number two. The government, for the government, 
Y'all, please forgive me. <laughs> please forgive me. The argument for striking John Doe 1 and John Doe 2 is first executed under the timeliness of the other acts evidence at the beginning of this motion. The second argument for why the John Doe 1 and John Doe 2 should be stricken as 404B witnesses is the same argument as stated regarding the Jane Doe's. Without knowledge of the names of John Doe 1 and John Doe 2, the defense cannot effectively show the court why each of the John Doe's should be stricken. If the names of the John Doe's are revealed to the defense, the defense would certainly be able to promulgate the proper response for objecting to their introduction under the law. However, given the time restraints in the trial schedule and with only 10 days left until the trial begins, the government, once again, I think that should be, should not be rewarded for its untimely and late disclosures. So they probably did a copy paste there. More importantly, the government should consider all of the reasons stated above in denying the government's motion as to John Doe 1 and John Doe 2. And then you guys, I don't know if you watched on Wine with Tasha K. I think it was Wednesday night. She did a video where she has a segment where she talks about John Doe 1 who... It was being put out on social media was Richard Arline. And according to Tasha K, she spoke to Richard Arline, who really couldn't talk that much, you know, about the case because he's inserted himself in it, you know, with the whole bribery to Azriel and now allegedly part of this John Doe 1 and John Doe 2. But according to Tasha K, Richard Arline told her that he is not John Doe 1. However, he may know who John Doe 1 is. Now, she didn't ask him about John Doe 2. Was he John Doe number 2? But uh, anyway, he said it ain't him, y'all. But he know who it is. And keep in mind that Richard Arline is supposed to be all in the church now. He married, got some kids. And I don't know why he would want any of this to be following him. You know, he's a young man. The whole future ahead of him. Like, why is he inserting himself into this R. Kelly case? I don't think he had any pending charges prior to him pretending to do that bribery thing. But whatever his reason for inserting himself, he did insert himself. And this is where we are. But he claims that it is not him. But we shall find out. And so number four, the conclusion for the reason set forth above the government motion in Lemony should be denied. And this um, was dated July 30th. They had until July 30th to file their response and then respectfully signed Thomas Farinella, Nicole Blank Becker, attorneys for the defendant Robert S. Kelly. And so maybe um, Thomas Farinella wrote this. I thought Nicole wrote it, but it looks like Thomas wrote it. I think it's a pretty good um, response to that motion. They pretty much said what all of us were saying, that this is BS. You're not giving R. Kelly enough time to prepare. How are they going to vet these people, vet their statements, do their investigation and research in time enough to be prepared for the trial? So now that, you know, they have filed their response, then we should hear from um, Judge Donnelly and that was one of the questions that came up on Twitter was why hadn't Judge Donnelly responded to the government well the judge isn't going to respond until both the government sits, submits their stuff the defense responds and then vice versa the, the defense submits something and then the government responds and then the judge will give their ruling and then there was some questions about sealed documents keep in mind that when the attorneys and the judge and whoever are submitting these documents they're submitting these documents electronically so if there's information in the document that is sensitive like they may be naming the Jane Doe's they may have some evidence or that type of stuff in the document that is not for public consumption then they have the option to file those documents as sealed documents it's not you know some strategy to keep the public from knowing what they're doing is 
court procedures that if you're naming people that are not supposed to be naming or if you're showing stuff that hasn't been approved to be a part of the case, then they file that under seal and then the court officials, whoever is responsible for monitoring that, will view the documents, they'll show it to the judge, they'll show it to the opposing party. And then at that point, they can decide if they want to make those documents public and what they'll do is they'll probably redact the names or you know um, delete whatever attachments were to the document and then they'll make it public and then in some instances it's not enough to even go through the trouble of redaction and they will just keep the document sealed because it the full nature of the document is confidential information so it's not you know trying to punish the public or punish the bloggers you know by withholding information from them they have their reasons for filing documents under seal and it's because it contains information that is not for the public eyes so guys that's it for me i apologize for the mishaps and the mistakes as i was reading this like i said i've been out um, doing my lawn all morning now i have some other stuff that i need to um go do and so i wanted to bring this to you all because i'm not sure i'm going to be back this weekend with any other videos for you so go ahead leave your comments below rate the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already and until the next time i shall talk to you guys later bye bye